The Crimes Ireland podcast is intended for a mature audience. Hello everyone and welcome again to the Crimes Ireland podcast. This time I'll be relaying the story of Rose Anne McCann and quote the trollic murderer Joseph Mum. I've got my new mic set up also but I do have a bit of a buggy fruit so I'm sorry if it's a bit croaky. The new mic should help the quality and the loudness so just watch your volume. It is also best to get used to the heavy usage of quotes in this episode as almost all of the information I could gather was from old archive newspaper reports from a publication called the Londonderry Sentinel. This was in and around 1904, and so I will be quoting several excerpts from them. Please note, this podcast is intended for mature audiences. Do not listen if the content will be of an offensive nature to you. Our case today takes place, quote, about one mile from the village of Trulloch, and in much of the same locality as that in which an old man named Funston was murdered and robbed some half dozen years ago. Charming. As I preluded to before, the victim in this case was a Mrs. Rose Anne McCann. She had lived in a cottage on the Badoni Road and lived with her young son, who was, quote, a smart little chap of about 12 or 13 years of age, and, quote, whose husband had gone to America to better his position. Other sources I find report Mrs. McCann's boy as 12. There was also an arrangement between the couple that Rose and the son was to follow when, quote, circumstances permitted. Joseph Mohan was 22 at the time and described as 5 foot 6 and also he was said to be of a boyish appearance. At the time, he had been employed for several years in and around Trillick as a farm labourer by trade. It is reported he had known Rose fairly well around the time. On the 20th of November 1902, he was spending the day in Trillick before going to his employment with a farmer who had lived in an opposite direction to the McCann home. Later that afternoon, Mrs McCann left her home and walked into the village to quote, get some household necessities. Making her way through the shop fronts, Rose browsed inside one of the grocers and one of the many she had visited that day. While buying some items and speaking to the shopkeeper, she regarded to either Joseph or the shopkeeper themselves that Moan had been looking better since he was last seen almost three weeks ago by her. Shortly after Rose had said this to the shopkeeper, Moan turned to leave the property, saying he was going to a relative's house close by to write a letter. This relative was reported as being called McLaughlin, with no first name. When leaving the grocers, he should have been at McLaughlin's at around 5.30pm, but did not arrive that day until around 7pm. Once arriving, instead of writing a letter, he quote, at once slunk off to bed and lay for a couple of days, emptying bottle after bottle of whiskey in the meantime. From all the information I could gather, this is what happened after Joseph Moon left Trulloch's Spirit Grocery. As I had hinted at earlier, Moon didn't go back to McLaughlin's directly, but took the road towards Mrs McCann's, and she too by this time had left and started the walk home from the village, quote, during that dark and stormy afternoon. Somewhere on a lonely part of the road they had met, and Moon, quote, chatted with her for a short time and then made a proposal in which the woman at once rejected, and, quote, then happened the terrible deed. It is said in the same article that, quote, it is not hard to know what happened, and in terms of one's thinking at the time, it says, quote, he acted on the awful maxim that dead people tell no tales. Starting the awful assault, they struggled for a time before Moan pulled Rose's shawl up and around her head, using it to stifle her cries and, quote, savagely kicked the poor woman until her head was a mass of pulp. Wow. After the fact, the same shawl was used to drag the poor victim into an adjoining field to try and conceal her. The evidence of the encounter was clear with the, quote, as he now stopped again while dragging his ghastly burden, the spot was marked by a pool of blood. 
now succeeding in hauling Mrs. McCann to the field. He realised she was not deceased, and then, quote, in order to be more certain of her death, he pulled out a knife, a weapon which subsequently played an important part in securing his conviction, and then slashed out at the body and neck until satisfied that there was no further chance of life. The now murderer, Joseph Moan, raised his victim's body and had it thrown over a hedge into some bogland. Leaving the scene, he made his way across some fields, taking a track he was said to be, quote, well acquainted. This led him to a stream used to power a mill, where he washed the blood off his hands, the murder weapon, and possibly his clothes. Only then did he make the journey to his relatives named McLaughlin, where he lay in bed for two days until his arrest. At the first of the three trials in 1903, proceedings were overseen by a Lord Chief Justice at the Spring Assizes in Oma. The Assizes, mentioned, were a type of higher courts outside of Dublin that had jurisdiction prior to 1924, with the exception being Northern Ireland, having them until 1978. This system of justice is now retired and has been replaced by the Single Crown Court. Throughout all three trials, Moan was defended by a Mr. Thomas Patton, and on this day, the jury in the trial was split in their decision, with eight giving a guilty verdict and four not guilty verdicts. The second trial, this time held at the Summer Assizes, and the judge was a Mr. Justice Gibson. It went similar to the first, albeit a tighter run of things, so to speak. Quote, Eleven of the jury were prepared to sign a verdict of guilty, but one juror was not satisfied that the case had not been conclusively proven. His difficulty is the absence of blood on Moan's clothing, which he believed could not have been the case if he had been the murderer. With this, Moan was acquitted again. I, like you, perhaps are confused by the statement quoted. For me, it's the uncertainty of Moan not having any blood in his clothes as I am unsure if it was known at the stage if he did, and if he had washed them on the day. If he did not have a change of clothing at the relative's house he went to after the murder, you think there would be something on them, even with a quick wash in a stream. And during all three trials, Moan never, quote, explained, nor did he obtain anyone on his behalf to explain where he had been between half five and seven o'clock that afternoon. The defendant did not explain either for what reason he had to carry the knife used. A blade which, quote, on the day of the murder was seen to be perfectly new and sharp. There was some congealed blood between the handle and the steel of the blade, as if, according to a prosecution witness, Professor Berkeley, the weapon, quote, had been held in a hand saturated in blood. After this statement, Mr. D. S. Henry, King's counsel as it was at the time, took the stand and said, quote, The Crown had not sought out Moan as the man who committed the deed, and then endeavoured to construct a chain of evidence against him. It was a case of all the facts pointing and applying to Moan, and no one else, that had brought him into the dock. Lord Chief Barron, who was presiding over this trial, made no concealments of his own firm belief in the man's guilt. Defendant's counsel, Mr. Patton, made every point that they could, that could help his client to the utmost. But, as the Crown brought forward its case, supporting evidence and witnesses, and with little or nothing at all to disprove it, it could only go one way from there. The judge then sentenced Joseph Moan to death by hanging, for the murder of Rose Ann McCann. After the judge had finished, Moan had just stood up, saluted him, and said, quote, Thank you, my lord. And on the 5th of January, 1904, this sentence was carried out, and from his time of committal until his execution, he, quote, refused to believe that he was in any danger of execution. Although restless in his sleep and giving signs of troubled dreams, he persisted in believing in that a case of a prisoner charged with murder, and whose guilt two juries had disagreed unless they voluntarily confessed, would escape the capital sentence. Joseph Moan, in short, 
felt that he would be let off of the murder as long as there was no confession. Overestimating his understanding of legal proceedings and his own intelligence, he ended up getting his punishment in the end. I really hope you all enjoyed this recalling of a crime story from in and around the turn of the last century. If you have any questions at all about the episode or the show in general, please send them to crimesireland at gmail.com. You can also use this email to donate to the show to help support us and keep it going. Thank you very much and goodbye for now.